All right, slideshow, let me start. Okay, so what we're going to go over today, we're kind of switching gears here, and we're going to go into the cardiovascular system. The next three chapters involve the cardiovascular system. So that means the heart and the blood vessels and the blood. And today we're going to start out with the blood. We're going to look at, you know, the different components of blood, okay? All right, so um, when you have uh, your blood drawn, it's being drawn from a vein, and they put that into a test tube, uh, the whole thing looks kind of red. But if you put that tube into a centrifuge, which will spin the blood around, we'll, find it, we'll see at the end of centrifuging that the top of the blood is clear <laughs> and the bottom of the blood is red. So we see that the blood separates out into two different portions. So all of the blood together is called whole blood. But the white portion on top, that's called plasma. And this is really blurry. <coughs> and uh, the, um, the, the uh, red portion at the bottom, that is called formed elements. OK? So we've got plasma and formed elements. Now, the plasma, the clear portion of the blood, ends up to be a, a little over 50% of your blood typically. The average, it's about 45% of whole blood. And then the formed elements are a little less than 50%. On average, they're about 45% of your whole blood. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go over the different components of plasma and the different components of the formed elements. And we'll start by looking at plasma. This range will vary because of the water? So it varies, um, it, it, yes, it, it varies according to just different people. You know, men are going to have um, more red blood cells than women. Um, so it, it just it varies from person to person, but based on fluid, based on sex, based on some other kind of factors. Okay? All right, so when we look at the plasma, the clear portion, 92% of the plasma is water, right? 92% is water. So most of it, it's just a watery, extracellular fluid. But then we also have some plasma proteins in there, and we also have other solutes in there. So we're going to take a look at those three things in plasma. With the formed elements, 99.9% .9 of that red material at the bottom, that's red blood cells. So 99.9% .9 of the formed elements are red blood cells. And then we also have white blood cells in the formed elements, and that makes up less than 0.1%. So really not a lot of white blood cells. And then platelets, um, they make up less than 0.1%. So most of the red blood cells are, um, the red blood cells are mostly what makes up those formed elements. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the plasma proteins. All right, so first let's look at what I mean by plasma proteins. So if we have a blood vessel here, okay, there's just a portion of a blood vessel, right? Okay. And um, inside the red blood vessel, we have some red blood cells, right? And we have some white blood cells. Okay, in there. Um, in the fluid surrounding those cells, that's where the plasma is. So the plasma is the watery fluid surrounding those cells. Okay. All right. Now inside the plasma, there are these proteins that we call plasma proteins. Okay. And like I said, the plasma proteins make up about 7% of all the plasma. And there's three different types of plasma proteins. Now, the thing is, when we look at the plasma, this is extracellular fluid because it's fluid outside of the cells. But if we looked in the um, interstitial fluid out here, so this is the rest of your body outside of the blood vessel. Here's the cells of some of your tissues out there. This is the interstitial fluid. Okay. 
okay? So the interstitial fluid here, so this is extracellular fluid because it's outside of cells, and the plasma is extracellular fluid because it's outside of cells. Can you guys see that? So they're both extracellular fluids, and they're both very, very much alike, okay? Very much alike, except these plasma proteins are at a much higher concentration inside the blood vessel than they are outside the blood vessel, all right? Otherwise, everything else is the same. The sodium levels in the plasma is going to be the same as it is in the interstitial fluid. Chloride is going to be the same. Potassium is going to be the same. All those ions, the water content is going to be the same. It's all the same. The big difference between those two fluids is the plasma proteins inside the blood vessel. And those plasma proteins are too big to get out, right? They're too big to get out. So um, that's where we start. Now we're going to look at the very first plasma protein, which is called an albumin. When we saw that the reabsorption of water in the AD, uh, the water goes through the interstitial fluid, then the Correct. blood vessel? Correct. Oh, okay. Yep. Very good. Correct. Yep. So when the kidney um, is reabsorbing the water, it first has to get reabsorbed into the interstitial fluid, and then it has to go into the blood. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so the first plasma protein here is called the albumin. And the albumins make up 60% of this fluid in this plasma. Okay? 60%. Um, and so the main job of the albumins is to create an osmotic pressure. It creates an osmotic pressure in the plasma. So what does that mean? What does osmotic pressure mean? Water is going to do what? It's going to move towards the solutes, right? So they're moving toward, water's going to move towards those, um, those plasma proteins, right? So the blood vessels are never going to completely dehydrate. They're always going to have water in them. And so these these albumins help to draw fluid back into the blood vessels. Okay, so that's what the albumins do. They help to create uh, and that osmotic pressure of the plasma. That's what albumins. The next one is called a globulin. Globulins um, are plasma proteins. They're about 35% of all the plasma proteins. And globulins can be one of two things. Um, they can either be antibodies. Okay? So some of the plasma proteins are not going to look like that type of protein. They're going to look more like this, which is an antibody. All right? So that's a globulin. Okay? And the other globulins are going to be transport globulins. Transport globulins. So what they can do, they have little receptor sites, and they can carry drugs, right? They can carry drugs through the body. They can carry hormones. So they can carry hormones through the blood, too. And they can bind to small ions. So they could bind to, you know, sodium or potassium calcium, carry those ions through the blood, okay? So that's what the globulins are. They're either antibodies or they're transport molecules, transport um, globulins. And then the last type of plasma protein is called a fibrinogen, fibrinogen. And fibrinogen, we're going to see this at the end of the chapter, but that deals with blood clotting. So when there's a cut in the blood vessel, there's a cut through the blood vessel, then those fibrinogen are going to help to stop the blood from leaking out. Okay? They're going to stop the blood. That's called hemostasis. All right, so that's, um, that's 7 percent. The, the um, plasma proteins are 7% of plasma. Water's 92%. Um, and then we have um, solutes. And these other solutes, you know, floating around in the plasma, it's going to be the same as what's floating around in the interstitial fluid. 
We've got some nutrients in there. So we're going to have glucose and amino acids and fatty acids. Okay, so those are you know, lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. So they're, they're floating around in there, the nutrients are. Of course, there's going to be electrolytes. The biggest electrolyte that there is, um, the one in the most um, abundant is sodium. Right? So sodium is going to be in the extracellular fluid, in the plasma. Um, and we also have potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride. You know, any of those electrolytes that have a negative or a positive number to them, we're going to see those in the plasma too. And then finally, the plasma is going to help to carry waste products. So we've got some waste products um, that your tissues, your cells produce a waste product when they're metabolizing. Things like urea and uric acid and bilirubin. We'll talk more about those when we get to the urinary system. But the cells produce the waste product, and then that has to be carried away. It has to be carried to the kidneys so you can urinate it out, or it has to be carried to the um, um, the liver so the liver can get rid of it through um, feces. Okay, somehow we got to get rid of it. We have to get it to the liver and the kidney, so that's going to be carried in the plasma as well. All right, so those are just some of the other solutes that are found in plasma. All right, the, um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the formed elements. So we just went over the plasma, we talked about um, water, plasma proteins, and other solutes. Now we're going to look at the formed elements. The formed elements are the cells, the specialized cells, and um, cell fragments. We're going to talk about those. And so it's the red blood cells the white blood cells, and the platelets. Platelets, um, the reason why we don't just say cellular, this is in, why we say formed elements instead of just cells, is because the platelets aren't complete cells. They're just actually little tiny fragments of cytoplasm and cell membrane that have been pinched off of a bigger cell. That's what platelets are. And what platelets do, and we'll see this also at the end of the chapter, platelets are involved in the start of blood clotting. They help to form platelet clubs, which will um, lead to a blood clot. Okay, so that's what platelets are, so we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, another name for a platelet is a thrombocyte. Thrombocyte. And then we have the white blood cells. Um, the white blood cells, there are five different types of white blood cells. So we're going to go through each one, and you're going to have to know just a little bit, just a little bit about each one. Okay. Um, white blood cells help um, in, to protect your body against foreign cells or foreign toxins. Any toxins or foreign cells, the white blood cells, are going to destroy. Okay. And um, another name for white blood cell is leukocyte. Leuco means white, cyte means cell, so leukocyte. And we have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and we're going to talk about all of those and what they do. Okay, and remember, the platelets are less than 0.1% of the formed elements. White blood cells are less than 0.1% of the blood cells of the formed elements. It's the red blood cells that are 99.9% .9 of the formed elements. Another name for red blood cells is erythrocyte. Erythro means red, cyte means cell. So those are erythrocytes. And they are specialized uh, cells that will carry oxygen, and um, they transport oxygen to the tissues. And they can also transport carbon dioxide, which is a waste, away from the tissues. So, but they're specialized, they, um, especially for the transport of oxygen. And this is where we're going to start. We're going to start by looking at the red blood cells. Okay, so. If you were to draw blood out of a person's vein and then you were to take a drop of blood and put that on a little microscopic slide and then slide it across to make one layer of cells and put it under a microscope, this is what it would look like. 
So each one of these things are red blood cells. And when you look at it, you say, well, it's got a, like a, a, looks like a donut almost because there's a white center in most of those cells. It's kind of like a donut, but the center area is um, not open. Okay, it's filled in. So that's what the, that's a microscopic slide. If we take more, um, a three-dimensional look at it, we can see what I mean. It's thicker on the outside, and then it's real thin on the inside. Okay, so it's um, it's not a donut. It doesn't have that empty space inside of it. So that's a three-dimensional shape of it. If I show you a, a diagram of it, this is actually what the um, red blood cell looks like. So it's it's you know bigger on the outside than thin on the inside. It's like a big inner tube, but the inside is filled in, okay? So this particular shape allows this red blood cell um, to stack next to another red blood cell. So we get stacks of red blood cells next to each other, and we still have um, the greatest amount of surface area showing. Uh, it's still exposed, right? So it's it's like a, um, a big surface to volume ratio on the, on the ends there. Um, let me show you this picture here. When the red blood cells get to the smallest blood vessels that you have, which are called capillaries, that's where oxygen can move in and out of the blood vessel. Um, so we have these red blood cells are stacked next to each other, like dinner plates, right? And they're moving through these tiny little blood vessels in single file. One of you know, single file stacked together. That's making them move really slow, but because the outside of the red blood cell is wider, that's what's exposed. So there's a lot of surface area that's exposed on each red blood cell so we can get oxygen to move out of the red blood cell and carbon dioxide to move into the red blood cell. Right? We call that stacking rouleau. It just allows um, the shape of the red blood cells allows the red blood cells to stack single file and move through the capillaries. Okay. All right. Now, um, on the inside of the red blood cell, we notice a couple of things. So this is the cytoplasm in here. There's no nucleus. What does that tell us? It can't divide, right? So it's not going to be able to divide. What else? What can't it produce with no DNA? Any more proteins. It can't produce proteins, right? Transcription begins with the DNA, right? That's where we begin it with the DNA. So it can't produce proteins, which means this red blood cell is not going to be able to repa um, repair itself. So it's not going to live long. The red blood cell is only going to live about 120 days, about four months, and then it dies. There's no way for it to repair itself. Now, the red blood cell was formed where? Where do we make blood cells? In the red bone marrow. So when the blood cell is being made in the red bone marrow, in its very most immature form in the red bone marrow, it does have a nucleus. And the nucleus produces a protein that's called hemoglobin. But by the time this red blood cell gets released into circulation, the nucleus gets ejected from the cell, and that's why the red blood cells don't have a nucleus. But they are filled with the protein that that nucleus made. So they're filled with hemoglobin, okay? They're filled with hemoglobin. Let's see what hemoglobin looks like. Okay, so this is a hemoglobin <coughs> molecule. A hemoglobin molecule is actually made up of four different proteins. Four, not different, but four proteins. Four tertiary proteins. So we have a tertiary protein here, and here, and here, and here. Okay? So what does a tertiary protein mean? Well, what are proteins made of? Mm -hmm. Amino acids. So a primary structure of a protein would be a single line of amino acids. A secondary would be if we took that single line and we made it into um, either helical like this or into more um, of a zigzagged line. That's secondary. 
A tertiary protein is when we take that zigzagged line or that helical formation and we wind it together like an old um, telephone cord. It's wound up like that and it gets really old. That would be a tertiary structure of a protein. So now we've got four of these tertiary structures. Okay, and when we have four tertiary proteins put together like that, we say that it's a quaternary structure. So now we have a protein, a hemoglobin protein, that's a quaternary structure. All right, so what, how, why is that important? Well, if we look at each one of the tertiary proteins, we can see that there's a heme group at the center of it. So in one hemoglobin, there are four heme groups. Four heme groups. At the center of each heme group is an iron. All right. Iron binds to oxygen. Okay. Iron binds to oxygen. So we have four heme groups. We have four irons in one hemoglobin. So each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules. Okay, in every red blood cell, there's about 250,000 hemoglobin molecules. So how many oxygen can one red blood cell carry? About what? About 250,000 times four, it's about a million, right? A million oxygen molecules. Each red blood cell can carry about a million oxygen molecules. Pretty amazing, right? It's a lot of oxygen. Okay, so that's, um, that's the structure of the red blood cell. This is showing what's happening inside the red bone marrow when the um, red blood cell is being produced. So it starts out, um, it actually starts out, up here it shows you a stem cell called the um, the proerythroblast, and that proerythroblast came from a, a more omnipotent stem cell that we'll talk about in just a minute. But there's a there's a grander um, uh, stem cell that can either become a proerythroblast or it, it can become different things. So it can become any of the blood cells. We're starting with the proerythroblast. So in producing a red blood cell. We can see day one, day two, day three, day four, day five to seven. So it takes your red bone marrow about a week to produce a red blood cell, okay? It starts out as a proerythroblast, and what do we see inside that cell? A nucleus, and what is that nucleus producing? The hemoglobin, right, the hemoglobin protein. So it's producing that, and then we see by day four, by day four, the nucleus gets ejected. We're still inside the red bone marrow, but now the nucleus gets ejected, and we end up with this immature red blood cell called a reticulocyte. It's got all the hemoglobin that it's ever going to have, and the nucleus is ejected from the cell. Then that reticulocyte enters the bloodstream um, as a mature red blood cell. Okay? So that's how red bone marrow is formed in the, uh, in the bone marrow. And that's as complicated, as in-depth as you need to be with it. Know that it takes about seven days. Know that it starts with a nucleus. Know the nucleus is producing the hemoglobin by day seven. Uh, by day four, the nucleus is ejected. The person who is um, uh, slow in a red blood cell, the problem is in the brain. Okay, so um, yes. If they're not producing enough red blood cells, the problem could be in the bone marrow. But not all anemic persons have. Good, good. So anemia. Let's look at anemia. Okay. Um, so with anemia, when a person is anemic, basically what you're saying is that the tissues are not getting enough oxygen, and it has something to do with the blood. So it's going to be one. It's going to be um, could be a number of things. This is where the problem. Could Maybe the person's not producing enough red blood cells. If they don't have enough red blood cells, they don't have enough cells to carry oxygen. Maybe the person is not producing enough hemoglobin. If they don't have enough hemoglobin, they don't have enough oxygen. They can't carry enough oxygen, right? 
maybe the person doesn't have enough iron, right? If they don't have enough iron, then they don't have anything to carry, they don't have enough to carry the oxygen levels. So there's many different um, types of anemia um, that come from many causes. And in addition to that, there's another anemia that's called sickle cell anemia, in which the red blood cell is abnormally shaped. And it actually looks like it's in the shape of a sickle, um, you know, like a, a sickle like farmers would use in the field. And so then that's not going to have enough hemoglobin. Um, it's not going to be able to stack properly going through the capillaries. So you're not going to be able to get as much oxygen that way either. And in any case, if your cells cannot get oxygen, you're going to be very tired. Your cells can't function. They can't create ATP because they don't have the oxygen. They need oxygen and glucose to make ATP. And your cells are going to seem extremely tired. And if they're forced to um, be exertion, you know, ex uh, if there's forced exertion and you don't have enough oxygen, then cells are going to die. And if it's the muscle, if it's the heart cells that die, then a person could end up with um, heart failure. So it's, it's very important to, that your tissues get enough oxygen. If that were the problem. Okay. Yep. If the problem is that you don't have enough iron, then you get iron in your diet. Okay. If the problem is, you know, if it's a pernicious anemia, then it's a B12, then the person has to get B12. Um, if the person is not producing enough red blood cells, then they might be given erythropoietin because that stimulates the red bone marrow to produce red blood cells. Okay, so um, always depends on what the issue is. So then they do blood tests to figure that out. Okay, so now we're going to look at what happens to the red blood cell. What is its life? It only lives for four months, right? It lives for 120 days, doesn't have a nucleus, can't repair itself, it's going to die. Well, what we're going to see eventually is that those, um, those red blood cells that are old are going to either be excreted in the feces or they're going to be excreted in urine. One way or another, um, we're going to get um, the majority of the red blood cell out. So let's take a look at this and see what happens, what the steps are. So first of all, um, the red blood cell, here's the red blood cell as it comes out of the red bone marrow, has a lifespan of 120 days. If it starts to get old, it might just burst. Okay, and we call that hemolysis where the red blood cell just burst. Um, or it might just start to look kind of old. And so this big cell here, which is a macrophage, that will come along and engulf the old looking cell or the broken up cell parts. So it engulfs it, okay? Then the macrophage digests it. So it's separating out all of the parts of it. And the iron, the macrophage will transport by the bloodstream back to the bone marrow, and then the bone marrow can reuse the iron. Okay. The rest of it, um, the rest of the, the heme group will be broken down into bilirubin and then bilirubin, and bilirubin is going to be carried through the bloodstream to the liver, and the liver will excrete that out in the feces. So the bilirubin is carried to the liver, and then it's going to be excreted in bile into the large intestine, um, into the small intestine actually, go through the large intestine, and then it'll come out in the feces. So that's how we're going to be able to get rid of that, um, that bilirubin. The rest of it um, Parts of the red blood cell that are broken down that the macrophage doesn't get a hold of, that will be that will end up going through the kidney. <coughs> okay, so the little broken up pieces of red blood cell that's not phagocytized, that the macrophage did not get to, that will just um, the blood will flow through the kidney and then the kidney will just excrete that out. So the big picture is. Iron gets recycled, and the bilirubin gets excreted in the feces, and the other um, broken parts of the red blood cell will end up being urinated out. So hemoglobin is going to be urinated out, or it's going to um, be excreted in the feces. 
I'm sorry if I have a question. No, no, but that's good. Um, when uh, this broken heart goes through the urine, does it appear in a thing like this? Um, no. No, nope, because it's not, um, it's broken up. It's completely digested. It's completely broken up by enzymes in the, in the blood. <coughs> and also the, the, the baby gets yellow because its liver is not functioning. That's why. Because of the baby. Right. The baby. So then you're not excreting that. You're not able to excrete that in the feces, so then that builds up in the blood, and that has kind of like it builds up in tissues, and it ends up giving a um, yellow the appearance. Liver, then, the, problem. the problems in the liver, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Good questions, Marianne. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about here is. Um, you guys need a break at all, or you're doing okay? Otherwise, I can do this and then take a quick break. No break. All right. So let's see, because it's going to be a shorter lecture anyway. We're not going to stay here the whole time. So. Let's talk about blood typing. Okay, blood typing. So um, every single cell in your body has a name tag on it, and that name tag is an antigen. Okay, and that those antigens tell your immune system not to attack your cells. If you have a foreign cell that comes into your body, your, um, it's going to have a foreign antigen on it, and your immune cells will attack it. They'll attack it and destroy it. Okay, So we don't want anything. So a bacteria coming in is going to have a foreign antigen on it. Our immune cells will attack it. Okay? Um, a virus, same thing. Our body will attack it. A foreign red blood cell that comes into your body, if it has a foreign antigen on it, your immune cells will attack it. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are not having any foreign um, cells coming in that we feel are dangerous to the body. Okay, so in blood typing, um, we have found that your red blood cells can have um, one of two different antigens in uh, the ABO <coughs> blood typing. There's other types of blood typing, but the one that's most common is the ABO method of blood typing. Okay? So we look at the red blood cells and we look at the name tags. The name tags, again, are the antigens. So here's a person that has type A blood. On the surface of the red blood cell are these little circles we see. They're, they're illustrated by little circles. That is the surface antigen A. So a person that has type A blood will only have the surface antigen A on it. Okay? A person that is type B, we see the surface antigen B looks like a little blue triangle here. Okay? A person that's type B will only have the surface antigen B. B on it. It will only have the B name tag. Okay. A person that is type AB, they will have both the surface antigen A and the surface antigen B. They've got both of those antigens. They have both name tags on them, so they are type AB. And a person that's type O, if we look at their blood cell, they don't have either A or B antigen. So they have no antigen. They don't have the A or the B antigen on the surface of their red blood cells. So they are type O. Okay? All right. Now, that's the red blood cells. Now, there we have these immune cells called antibodies in the plasma. And the antibodies are going to protect that blood from any foreign red blood cells. Okay? So the antibodies protect from any against any foreign red blood cells. So type A, which has surface antigen A, would want to be protect, protected from what antigen? What would be the opposing antigen? B, right? So a person that's type A is going to have the B antibody. Okay. A B antibody 
will attack a B antigen. Okay? So a person that has the surface antigen A, they are type A, and they have the B antibody in their plasma. A person that's type B, they have the B antigen on their red blood cell, <laughs> and they want to protect themselves against the A antigen. So they are going to have the A antibody in their plasma. Okay, because A antibodies will bind to the A antigen. Okay. A person that's type AB is not going to have any antibodies in their plasma. They have the A antigen and the B antigen. What would happen if this person had the A antibody? The A antibody would attack it, its own cell, right? What if it had the B antibody? The B antibody would attack its own cell. So a person that's type AB cannot have any um, antibodies in their serum. And then here's a person who is type O. A person with type O doesn't have either of those antigens. So it really says any cell that has an antigen is going to look foreign to it, right? So it's going to want antibodies to protect itself against any cell that has an antigen on it. So it's going to have the A antibody and the B antibody in their plasma. So that if a cell that had an A or a B antigen entered into this blood, the A antibody would bind to the A antigen, the B antibody would bind to the B antibody. So let's take a look and see um, what happens when an antibody binds to an antigen. Now remember, the B antibody binds to the B antigen. The A antibody binds to the A antigen. Okay? So here we have red blood cells that have the B antigen on it, and they're put into a body that has the B antibody. The B antibody binds to B antigen. And what happens is these antibodies have a, they're a Y shape. Okay, so they're, they're like this Y shape, like this. And so a red blood cell can bind to one of the arms. So the, the arm of that antibody will bind to one of those antigens. And then the other arm of that antibody will bind to another red blood cell. Okay, and so what we end up happening have is that these antibodies are binding to the antigens, and pretty soon all of those um, red blood cells start to clump together because one antibody can hold on to two separate red blood cells. Okay, because it's binding to the antigen. Now we start to see all these red blood cells clumping together. We call that agglutination, agglutination. So an agglutination can cause two different things to happen. Well, a couple of different things to happen. Um, first of all, those red blood cells could just burst. So if those red blood cells are bursting, that means nothing's there to carry your oxygen. Your tissues are not gonna get oxygen, they're gonna die. Another thing that happens is your macrophages are gonna look and see all these antibodies kind of like waving like flags, and the macrophages will come along and engulf the whole thing, okay? Anyway, we're gonna destroy those red blood cells because we had an opposing antibody to that, um, that, that B antigen, okay? So now um, we look at what happens in what's called a cross-reaction. A cross-reaction occurs when a red blood cell is given to a donor or given to a recipient who has the opposing antibodies. So when a person is donating their blood, their blood is centrifuged down and the red blood cells are what's given, okay? The red blood cells that are going to be donated, right? So all we have to do when we're looking at the donated blood 
is we have to look at their red blood cells. And we look at that red blood cell being placed into a human that's going to have the antibodies. Okay? So let's look at a person that's um, type A. Say this person is the donor. We centrifuge this and we get rid of the antibodies and all we're giving is the red blood cell. This red blood cell has the A antigen. Okay? So this red blood cell can be given to anyone who doesn't have the A antibody because it's the A antibody that will attack it, right? So who can type A be given to? Who does not have the A antibody? Type A doesn't have the A antibody. Type A had the B antibody. And type AB doesn't have the A antibody, right? Type B has the A antibody, so we get a cross-reaction there. And type O has the A antibody. So we get a cross-reaction there, right? Let's look at a person with type B. Type B has just the B antigen on it. So this cell cannot come in contact with the B antibody. The B antibody will attack this cell, right? So we're giving this red blood cell. Who can we give that red blood cell to? Can we give that red blood cell to type A? No. Can we give this red blood cell to type B? Yes. Can we give it to type AB? Yes. Can we give it to type O? No. Okay. okay. Let's look at type AB. Type AB has both the A antigen and the B antigen. You cannot give that cell to any person that has the A antibody or the B antibody. So who can you give type AB to? Only AB, right? Because it's the only type that doesn't have the antibody. Okay? If we look at type O, and again, we're only giving the red blood cell. We're not, we're taking out the plasma. If we only give this red blood cell to someone, it has no antigens on it, who can we give it to? Anybody. There's nothing on this red blood cell to bind to. You could give it to the type A because the B antibodies can't bind to it. You can give it to the type B because the A antibodies can't bind to it. You can give it to AB because there's no antibodies. You can give it to type O because um, there's nothing on this cell to bind to those antibodies. So for that reason, we say that type O is the universal donor. Type O is the universal donor because of that. Because we've given the red blood cell and there are no antigens on that red blood cell. Now when we looked at type AB, type AB can only give to AB. But who can type AB receive from? Which red blood cells can type AB receive? Can they receive this red blood cell? Yeah, there's no antibodies in type AB. Can we give this red blood cell? Yeah, no antibodies. Can we give this red blood cell? Yeah, no antibodies. So we call type AB the universal recipient because they have no antibodies. So they can receive any blood type and not have a cross reaction. So when you're in lab today, you're going to do some blood typing on some fake blood. So um, four different um, individual fake bloods, and you're going to type out their blood. And you're going to add antibody to their red blood cells. So if you add the A antibody and those red blood cells agglutinate, that tells you that the A antigen was present because there was something for that A antibody to bind to. So you can say that person has the A antigen on their red blood cells. Take that same uh, red blood cells, a different sample, put the B antibody in there. If you get clumping there, what is it telling you that's also on the red blood cell? 
the B antigen. Okay. So now we can say that person is AB. Type AB because they have both the A and the B antigens. So we're going to go over that in class. Right? Um, one last thing, and then I'm going to take a quick break here. I want to talk to you about another antigen that goes along with the ABO blood typing. And that is called the RH antigen or the D antigen. So you guys have heard of the RH factor. A person is either RH positive or RH negative, right? So um, on that, And I'm just going to use RH instead of D because D is kind of, um, that kind of confuses people. So here's a person's blood cell and here's another person's blood cell. Okay, If the person has the RH antigen on their red blood cell, we say they are RH positive. Okay. If they don't have the RH antigen, they are considered RH negative, right? So either they have it or they don't. And when we're, um, when we're naming blood, um, we have to take the RH into account, and then we also look at the surface antigens. So if this person also had the surface antigen A on there, we would say this person is A RH positive, and we drop the RH, and we just say they are A positive. Okay. If this person over here had the B antigen on the surface of their cells, and they did not have the RH, they would be considered type B RH negative. We drop the RH and we just say they are B negative. Okay. Now the thing with this is um, in the plasma we have to look at the antibodies. Um, the the um, RH positive person can never have the RH antibody. Why not? What does the what does the RH antibody bind to? The RH antigen. So a person that's Rh positive would never have the Rh antibody in their plasma. A person that is Rh negative, they're born, when they are born, they do not have the antibody. But if they become exposed to the antigen, they will develop throughout their life the Rh antibody. So it's something that's developed. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about the hemolytic disease of the newborn, um, and then I don't have much more time left so in this lecture. So I'm just going to give you like four minutes to stand, talk, do what you need to do just to um, regenerate. Okay, I want to talk to you about um, a disease that uh, deals with this cross-reaction that's called um, the hemolytic disease of the newborn. Okay, hemolytic disease of the newborn. And so um, this is only going to occur when the mom is, um, when she is a RH negative. When she's RH negative, and the baby's blood is Rh positive. Okay? This is going to happen because she's Rh negative and she doesn't have any antibodies until she comes in contact with the baby's Rh antigen. All right, so let's look and see what happens. Here is mom during her first pregnancy. And this is her blood up here and this is baby's blood down here. So in her blood, we can see that she's Rh negative. So we can on her red blood cells, she does not have the Rh antigen, right? The baby, though, 
um, we look at the baby blood and a baby has the Rh antigen on the blood. So if that Rh antigen came in contact with mom's blood, she would start producing antibodies and she would attack um, that baby's blood. Okay? But in the first pregnancies, we have that placenta, there's no crossing. Those red blood cells are too big and they can't cross over that placenta. So there's no mixing of that blood. So mom doesn't develop the antibodies. So mom doesn't attack the baby's blood and that baby should be born um, you know, without any problems in that first pregnancy, right? So, but what happens during the um, birth is there's a lot of hemorrhaging, right? A lot of, lots of blood, um, baby's blood from the umbilical cord, mom's blood, we get all this blood kind of merging together and um, we get this mixing of blood between the baby and the mom. And now the mom's going to start developing antibodies because she's come in contact with those antigens, right? So she starts developing those antibodies, and now this is what mom's blood looks like. Baby's born, baby's okay. Mom now has the same Rh negative, but now she has the Rh antibody, okay? So what's going to happen in that second pregnancy? Now, if we look at that second pregnancy here, we can see, and I know this is small, right? Just stop for a minute. Here's mom's blood, here's her red blood cells, there's her <coughs> antibodies. This baby is also Rh positive, so she's got the um, Rh antigen. Red blood cells cannot cross the placenta, but the antibodies can cross the placenta. So mom's antibodies cross the placenta into the baby's blood and start uh, binding to the Rh antigen, causing them to go through hemolysis and burst. So baby is stillborn. Baby can't survive without oxygen, cannot survive without red blood cells. Mom's antibodies attack the red blood cells. Okay? So that's, um, that, that we learned about decades ago, and women would have multiple births and they would all be stillborn and not know what happened to the baby. Then they started to discover this um, incompatibility and how mom developed antibodies and the antibodies crossed the placenta. So now a woman is given a, um, an injection called um, Rogam. Rogam. Um, so she'll be given that so that she doesn't even develop the antibodies. She'll be given that in her first pregnancy so that she doesn't even develop the first um, the antibodies at all. And then she'll be given that in subsequent um, pregnancies <coughs> as well. Just to ensure that she is not developing those antibodies so those antibodies won't cross the placenta. Okay? So, all right. Yes? Can the situation be reversed where the mom is positive and then the baby is So if the mom is positive, she will never have antibodies. And the hemorrhaging happens at, um, you know, the, the baby, if the baby is Rh negative, they're not going to have antibodies either because they haven't been exposed to it yet, right? So even at birth, when the baby's born, um, there's a mixing of blood that the mom is hemorrhaging, but the baby's not going to, they're not going to be exposed. Yeah, they won't be exposed to the mom's, you know, Rh positive blood. Okay. Now we don't know. We don't know what the baby's blood type is, right? We don't know. So any woman that is Rh negative, um, they're going to be given that shot to prevent the um, production of those antibodies because we don't know what the blood type of the baby is without doing extensive tests. Okay. So that's the hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, all right. So now we're going to move in. I know this is. We're going to move a little bit uh, faster here. Um, I thought we were going to get out early. I apologize. I don't think we are now, but um, we're going to look at white blood cells, okay? There's um, five different white blood cells, neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, monocyte, and lymphocyte. We're going to go over a couple of things about each one of them just so you have an idea of what they do. The white blood cells, again, they make up less than 0.1% of the formed elements. You need to know... Um, what they are, um, what's most abundant, which one of these is most abundant, all the way down to which one's least abundant. And so there's a mnemonic that you can use. 
Never let monkeys eat bananas. Okay, so the neutrophils are the most abundant and the basophils are the least abundant. Okay. Never let monkeys eat bananas. All right, so we'll start and we'll just, we're just gonna go down the line and we're gonna look at these cells. You can see this, what these white blood cells are in, you know, you can see red blood cells all the way around them. You can see with the white blood cells, each one of them has a nucleus, so they can produce proteins, right? So they're gonna produce proteins which are gonna help in the immune system. And we'll start by looking at the neutrophil. The neutrophil is a phagocytic cell, so it can engulf things. Um, this guy is going to be, he can move through the, the blood, right? He can move through the blood, he can even squeeze his way out of blood vessels and get into the tissues. And so this, this neutrophil, um, these neutrophils are going to be the first ones at the site of an injury or an infection. The first ones there. And they just start engulfing things. And as they're engulfing things, they're going to start producing pus. So whenever you see pus, you're going to see in that sample a lot of neutrophils. All right, so that's what I want you to know about neutrophils. First one there, most abundant and they're found in pus. They produce pus as they're engulfing these things. They are phagocytic. The next one we have is the eosinophil. So this is not a very, it's not a very abundant one. Um, it is also um, phagocytic, so it's gonna engulf things too. But where the neutrophil, that would engulf anything it saw that was a toxin or that was damaged or looked foreign. Um, the eosinophil is going to target parasites, parasites. So, you know, you, you, drink, you, you drink some water that's not clean and there's parasites in there. The eosinophils are going to start engulfing those parasites. They also are going to, um, when you come in contact with something that you're allergic to and it's called an allergen, they'll start engulfing the allergens too. But whenever they start engulfing things, then they get bigger and then they start to reproduce. So when you have a parasitic infection, you're gonna see an increased count of eosinophils. Same thing with the neutrophils. When they engulf things, they get bigger, they're going to reproduce then, and that count is gonna go way up when there's an acute bacterial infection or an acute infection. So that's what they do. They're engulfing things, getting bigger, and then they're multiplying. This is a basophil. Now the basophil is not phagocytic. The basophil, if you look in the cytoplasm, um, it looks like there's a bunch of granules in there. There is. That nucleus has been making a bunch of granules, a bunch of proteins called histamine and heparin. Histamine and heparin. And histamine and heparin, they both contribute to inflammation. They cause inflammation. How do they do that? They dilate the blood vessels in that localized area, so you sprain your ankle. The blood vessels in the ankle are gonna dilate, and that's gonna make the blood vessel more permeable, and fluid's gonna leak out into the tissue and make the ankle swell, right? So the cardinal signs of inflammation are redness, heat, swelling, and pain. And then the fifth one that we don't talk about as much is loss of function. When you sprain that ankle, you can't stand on it anymore, right? That's a loss of function. So we get, um, we get uh, swelling, heat, redness, and pain. And that's what the histamine and heparin are creating. The next one is called a monocyte. Monocyte. Now the monocyte, um, this one is also, you know, it's looking for things in the blood. But whenever there's an infection, uh, it's going to squeeze out of the blood and it's going to go to that area as well. And once it's out of the blood and it's in the tissue, we call it a macrophage, okay? A macrophage. It's a phagocytic cell. It's going to engulf things and it's going to really help out in the immune system. Because not only does it engulf and digest things, it's going to present it on the outside of its cell then. We'll talk about this in the immune system. But it presents the antigen, the foreign antigen, on its cell surface, and that's going to start an immune response. So the macrophage, the monocyte, is a big part 
of the um, immune system. Now, sometimes when the monocyte squeezes out and it's a macrophage and it goes to other areas in your body, it's going to, um, it's going to become a permanent resident of that area. And then we're going to give it a name, a specific name. Like the macrophages in your brain, those are called microglia. Right? The macrophages in your liver, those are Kupfer cells. The macrophages in your um, lungs, those are alveolar macrophages. So if those macrophages take up residence somewhere, they have a specific name for them. Okay? But the monocyte, it's a phagocytic cell. It will become a macrophage once it squeezes out of the blood vessel. Then we have the lymphocyte. And the lymphocyte is, um, can either be the T cell or the B cell. We're going to talk a lot more about this, but these, these cells are um, very specific in what they will attack, what they're going to um, defend against. So for instance, this particular lymphocyte, um, if this were a T cell, it might only be um, activated to attack um, a strep pneumonia bacteria. That's it. Or maybe it's only activated to attack a chickenpox virus. Okay? So these lymphocytes are very, very specific. We say they're part of our specific immune system. When we get to chapter 22, we're going to talk more about the immune system then. So lymphocytes deal with the immune system. Okay. Um, now, let's briefly talk about platelets. We're almost done here. Platelets are, um, another word for those, another name, are thrombocytes. Um, platelets are just fragments of cells. And so um, I'm going to show you how they work in um, hemostasis. But um, before I do that, let me show you how they're formed and how all of the red blood cells are, how all of the formed elements are formed. Right? So this is what you have to know. All of them are formed in the red bone marrow. They start out as this big omnipotent stem cell called a hemocytoblast. Okay. Now the hemocytoblast can become either a myeloid stem cell or it can become a lymphoid stem cell. So it specializes. It goes through mitosis, the daughter cell will either become will either be a myeloid stem cell or will be a lymphoid stem cell. Okay. The lymphoid stem cell will only produce a lymphocyte. So it'll go through a maturation process, it'll start to mature, but the lymphoid stem cell can only become a lymphocyte. Okay? The myeloid stem cell, the myeloid stem cell can go through that process that we saw with the red blood cell and it can become a red blood cell, or the myeloid stem cell can become a platelet, or the myeloid stem cell can become those other four white blood cells, any white blood cell except for the lymphocyte. So it can become a basophil, eosinophil, neutrophil, or monocyte. Right? So the myeloid stem cell gives rise to all of the blood cells except the lymphocyte. The lymphoid stem cell gives rise to only the lymphocyte. Right? All right, so um, what I want to show you here, because we're looking at platelets, is that in this process of creating a platelet, um, the myeloid stem cell becomes a huge cell called the megakaryocyte. And the megakaryocyte, part of its cytoplasm is pinched off, and that's what a platelet is. It's just a little bit of the cytoplasm that's been pinched off. And I'm going to show you in the next step what happens in the, um, how the platelets help to form a blood clot. Before I do that, I just want to give you a couple of terms. Poiesis means the production of. That's what poiesis means. So in the process of making a red blood cell, that process is called erythropoiesis. Okay. The production, um, it's erythro. Erythro, and then poi, P, 
oesis. Erythropoiesis. We know the hormone erythropoietin stimulates erythropoiesis. Okay? Erythropoietin came from the kidney, remember, and it stimulated red blood cell production. The process of making a platelet is called thrombopoiesis. And the process of making white blood cells is called leukopoiesis. And if you're just talking about the lymphocyte, the process of making the lymphocyte is called lymphopoiesis. Right? So poiesis just means production of. The last thing I need to show you then is hemostasis. And these are, there's um, four different phases that occur whenever your blood vessels get cut. So we have to go through these phases very quickly. Um, the vascular phase, so here you see a blood vessel and you see that it's been cut by a knife, right? In this first phase, which happens right away, first of all, you're cutting through cells, so the ends of the blood vessel where they're cut, they get sticky. The cytoplasm's leaking out and it gets all sticky, right? That's gonna happen in this first phase, which is called the vascular phase. The second thing that happens in the vascular phase is that the ends of the blood vessels where they're cut, they're going to spasm. So we get what's called vascular spasm. So we're decreasing the diameter there of that blood vessel, so we're slowing down the amount of blood that's going to be lost where it's cut. Okay? So that's the vascular phase. The second phase is called the platelet phase. Right? So platelets here are moving through the blood, and they get to those sticky ends where the diameter's been a little decreased, and they start to stick to the cut ends of that um, blood vessel, and they form what's called a platelet plug. Okay. Now, Devin, you asked about um, aspirin. Right. Aspirin coats the platelets. They say that aspirin's like a blood thinner. It's not really a blood thinner. It coats the platelets and makes them sticky so that they don't stick to um, things and they don't form plugs like that. Sometimes plugs can form if your the platelets are going over a little placking, cholesterol placking, the platelets will cling to that. Well, if they're coated with this aspirin, they're not going to cling to it. They're slippery. Right? That's what aspirin does. So is that why you're supposed to give aspirin to somebody who's having a heart attack? So that yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's why a person's given like baby aspirin, low doses of aspirin, or once they reach a certain age and they have um, restricted cardiovascular disease. Yep, exactly. So anyway, the second phase, which is called the platelet phase, um, these platelets stick to the sticky ends and they form a platelet plug. So that's what happens in the platelet phase. We get a platelet plug formed. And now that's going to plug up that hole, right? It's going to plug up the hole. Then the, the third phase is called the coagulation phase. Um, and what happens, this was complicated, but if you remember in the plasma, we talked about the um, fibrinogen, one of the plasma proteins. Fibrinogen becomes activated and converts to fibrin. What is fibrin? Fibrin are these little strands of fiber, okay? So here we have fibrinogen, it converts to fibrin, and all the little fibrin um, pieces, all those fibers, intertwine in between the platelets and makes that a instead of a makes that platelet plug become a blood clot. So a stronger, sturdier, harder blood clot. So we go from a platelet plug to a blood clot because of that fibrin. All right, and then now we've stopped blood. That's hemostasis. We've stopped the blood from leaking out. The last phase is going to be the clot retraction. After the um, endothelium of the blood vessel knits back together and that blood vessel is now repaired, we have to get rid of the blood clot. And so um, we have the clot starts to um, undergo retraction where it just kind of gets absorbed back into the body, it gets dissolved. So the clot is being dissolved in the clot retraction. Okay, so those are the four phases of hemostasis. When you cut 
the blood vessel, uh, then the blood has to like to go the other way. Because or if you still temporarily, in. yes. But you have so many blood vessels in your body. Um, you're you're not talking about like the major blood vessels. If you cut the aorta, major blood vessel, then you're in big trouble. You have to have medical intervention. But if you're cutting a smaller blood vessel, you have a whole network of blood vessels that will carry the blood. Good. Yeah. Any questions then? All right. So remember, next week.